This is Earth Files, the award-winning news site with the latest updates in science, environment, and real X-Files. Podcasting in-depth reports beyond the 6 o'clock news by Emmy Award-winning journalist Linda Moulton Howe. In the past few weeks, I have interviewed scientists who are alarmed that global warming could destroy the Amazon and other rainforests and devastate the biodiversity of plants around the world. In Svalbard, Norway, construction begins in March to build a Noah's Ark to preserve the Earth's plants in a seed bank built inside an Arctic mountain. In the oceans, corals and much marine life are threatened with extinction. On land, millions and millions of honeybees that pollinate so many of the fruits, vegetables, nuts, and melons we expect in supermarkets have been disappearing in the United States, Spain, and Poland. And amphibians around the planet are dying out at an alarming rate. In the 20th century, there were about 6,000 species of amphibians. Today, in 2007, nearly half are in serious decline, one-third are threatened, and an estimated 122 species have become extinct since 1980. Amphibian species were around when dinosaurs dominated Earth, and amphibian species survived that asteroid catastrophe 65 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs. But amphibians now are not surviving what industrialized human civilization is doing to this planet. Amphibians, like honeybees, are considered to be something like canaries in coal mines that warn the miners when there is not enough oxygen to breathe. How do canaries warn? By dying. Many zoologists and other scientists now realize that the amphibians, with their very permeable skins, are so sensitive to their environment that it's a serious question in this modern world about how many can survive In the wild, if amphibians are being forced out of the world environment, what's going with them is one of the biggest potential medical chests in nature. For example, the skin of the Ecuadorian tricolor frog produces a pain reliever that is more powerful than morphine without any addictive side effects. The secretions from the Peruvian giant monkey frog are used to treat seizures and depression. The Australian red-eyed tree frog's skin secretes peptides that can disable HIV infection. Recently, scientists from around the world met in Atlanta, Georgia, to launch an amphibian ark in an effort to save thousands of frogs, toads, and salamander species threatened by fungi, pathogens, increasing UV radiation, and rapidly changing habitats in the face of global warming. The idea originated with the Conservation Breeding Specialist Group of the World Conservation Union. The goal for the amphibian ark is to have zoos, aquariums, and botanical gardens around the planet construct biosecure facilities to preserve at least 500 each of nearly 2,000 endangered amphibian species, especially frogs. After amphibians are collected for the amphibian arks, they would have to be cleaned of damaging fungi. Raising funds for such an international effort is linked to an upcoming global publicity campaign that will be designated in 2008 as the Year of the Frog. One of the world's leading amphibian researchers is Andrew Blaustein, Ph.D. and Director of the Environmental Sciences Graduate Program at Oregon State University in Corvallis. I asked Professor Blaustein why scientists are now saying it is urgent to build amphibian arcs around the world. Well, it seems like we're at a desperate point right now. We have a major extinction event on the planet. Extinctions are natural processes, but the rate at which extinctions are occurring across the planet in almost all taxonomic groups different types of organisms from plants to microorganisms to big mammals to frogs is unprecedented. At this point, we're losing species at such rates that we're so desperate that we're trying to do everything we can to preserve some of these great species, such as amphibians, and many of those species are frogs. Could even the amphibian arc be too late? 
for some of the species, it's going to be probably too late. For example, the golden toad, which used to be really common in Costa Rica, they're gone. In modern times, there were about 5,700 species of amphibians, maybe 6,000, okay? It is estimated that 43% of those species have populations declining, 32% of them are threatened, 168 are presumably extinct of that, about 122 probably became extinct since 1980. So you're talking about 6,000 species, 43% are declining, 32% are threatened, 122 have become extinct since 1980, and this is worse than birds and mammals. Amphibians are hit harder than birds or mammals, like dinosaurs. They're gone. What do you think is causing these die-offs of amphibians around the world? Well, I've always said that there are multiple causes for amphibian extinctions, and I'll name a few of them. Habitat destruction and habitat alteration is obviously one of the major causes. There are different types of pathogens. There's this fungus called the chytrid fungus, but there are also water moles, such as saprolignia. There are viruses. There are bacteria. Then there are also climate change problems, increasing temperature, global warming. There is ozone depletion and UV radiation. Of course, there's pollution, contamination. Uh, there are introduced exotic species. I mean, bullfrogs were introduced to the western United States. They're not native, and they're eating and competing with native western species. So there's all these things going on. What is worst case if the amphibians continue to go extinct? If you took amphibians away from the planet tomorrow, you would see a very big change in ecosystems. Amphibians are really important predators. They eat billions and billions of insect pests per year, and they eat other things too. Uh, They'll eat vertebrates, they'll eat snakes, eat fish, some of them eat birds, but you would notice a great increase in, in mosquitoes and, you know, or flies and things like that. They, they carry a lot of diseases that humans get. Also, lots of things eat amphibians. There are lots of fishes that eat them, birds eat them, mammals eat them. So the ecosystem would be drastically changed. As a matter of fact, in some ecosystems, such as in the northeastern forests of the United States, the amphibians sometimes comprise the largest group of vertebrates. There are more amphibians, if you weight them, add it up, than there are birds or mammals, for example. So they can be really important. What do you see this amphibian arc project doing? Well, from what I can gather, uh, the amphibian arc, it, we're just going to try to get as many of these amphibians. Most of them, I think, that they're talking about are from Central America area and try to propagate them in captivity with, uh, obviously, the expectation to release them later on and back into the field and we figure out what's going on down there. But it's going to be difficult because they're really not that easy to keep and breed in captivity. We don't know all the habits of these amphibians. We don't exactly know what they all eat or what they all need. I mean, there are some great exhibits. For example, I saw a great exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City a couple of years ago where they had these exotic species from Central America, and they're doing a great job. But to get them to actually breed in captivity... And to get their numbers increased is going to take great effort. What about your research on increased UV light because of thinning ozone? Do you think that that is playing any role in the extinctions of amphibians? Well, we think UV light is just one of the five or six reasons why amphibian populations are crashing. And one of the things that UV does, and we didn't know this when we first started what was going on, there seems to be a UV hits a living system, such as an amphibian, a fish, or a person, it hampers their immune systems. And when it hampers the immune system, the animal or the person or whatever we're talking about cannot cope with pathogens, with diseases. We think there's a relationship here that habitat destruction that causes stress or ozone depletion that causes more UV radiation actually hampers the immune system of these animals, and then they get diseases more easily. I don't think it's just, for example, a pathogen moves in and starts to wreak havoc. I think some environmental change induces some other changes where the pathogen gets to go rampant. So what you mean is that the fungus spreading is opportunistic on weakened immune systems. That's what I'm thinking. Now, I may be wrong, but that's what I'm thinking, and that's what a lot of my colleagues think. 
And that's exactly what seems to be emerging in this mysterious and huge disappearance of honeybees that's now affecting the United States, Spain, and Poland. They're finding a lot of fungus inside of the few bodies they've been able to find and do necropsies on. For the most part, they don't even have the bees. The question has been, why would fungus all of a sudden be killing off millions and millions of bees in the United States, Spain, and Poland? No, we think that would be another case of some kind of environmental change occurring or some type of stress due to environmental change that causes these fungi to be opportunistic and to knock off some of these natural populations of amphibians and bees and whatever. And Professor Blastine, what kind of future would we have if the honeybees die out and the amphibians die out? Well, I'm not a honeybee expert, but I'll tell you this. I've been hearing about this. You know, we're not just losing honeybees here, but honeybees. I mean, they're incredible pollinators. They're really important. If the frogs disappeared, I already told you, there would be unbelievable ecosystem damage. We have a lot of species that are disappearing that are going to influence how ecosystems function in the future. I mean, we're losing native earthworms because of exotic species of earthworms that have been introduced. It's already changed soil. I mean, this can obviously, if you change the soil, you're going to change what grows in the soil. And what you mean is that the earth is changing right now so rapidly and extinctions are the uh, product of all of these changes like dominoes falling. What is worst case from your point of view? Well, that's a good way of looking at it. I mean, the fact of the matter is I, I can't tell what's going to happen in the future, but we could make some predictions. As a matter of fact, I have a colleague who works with me. His name is Josh Lawler. He's going to be at the University of Washington in a few months as a new professor there. And uh, we have modeled some of the things that would happen if certain climate changes occurred. For example, if there were increased temperatures or different moisture regimes. And what you would see, the way we modeled this, is that you will see shifts in the range of species. You will see some species that become more northern. Some of the southern species will move up. When you get extinctions or if you get climate change, like from global warming, you will get species in new areas that weren't there before. So if the climate warms up in North America, we're already seeing this. We're expecting animals and plants and things that fly to move up north, and they may bring new pests with them or new diseases. We're already seeing an increase in malaria. We're already seeing increases in animals that cause dengue fever. We're seeing tropical diseases going into North America right now. The projection for sea level rise, which could be up in the UN's worst case, up to maybe four or five feet in the next 90 years, means that a lot of coastal populations of humans are going to have to move away from the coast. If you combine the extinction rates of amphibians, the extinction rates of honeybees, the extinction rates of plants, and you overlay that, over what is going to happen to human populations and human food needs, that we are going to have some kind of a major food challenge, aren't we? Well, we already have major problems now with population problems. Uh, I've seen um, some of the scenarios for the melting of the polar caps and all that, and I've seen the temperatures rising and what it would do to coastal regions. And, you know, my home area of New York would be underwater and <laughs> lots of Florida. But the fact is, you have to make the public aware of some of these problems. Global climate change is a fact. Ninety-five, probably, percent of the scientists who study the phenomenon agree, but you just got to make the politicians and the public aware of all this. We're looking at massive extinctions of many species. We have a major biodiversity crisis where animals and plants and microorganisms are declining at unprecedented rates. We have climate change that's helping this out. And we have a lot of problems here. We have increasing populations. So, I, I mean, I don't even want to predict what's going to be in 90 years. It's a scary situation. And do you think that the Noah's Ark ideas could make a difference? I think it's possible. It's going to be really difficult. As I said, it's like a desperation move where you have to take all these animals from their native habitats and try to rear them in captivity, propagate them, and release them. There are some success stories to doing this, you know. 
for example, American bison almost went extinct uh, in the early part of the century, but there were a few remnant individuals around, and they made populations were made in captivity so that they could reintroduce them. Uh, we tried to do this with the California condor. Amphibians might be a little tougher because we don't know a lot about them. They're a little more difficult in captivity. But it's, it's what we have to do. That's about it. I mean, I don't know what else to say. It's a desperation move. I'm talking about a group of animals, the amphibians, that were around when the dinosaurs were around. They were around before the dinosaurs. Now they're starting to get hit. They survived all that stuff, and now they're going down the tubes. The amphibians were there when the dinosaurs were there. They made it. They made it, and now they're not making it anymore. They're hurting. In 2007, what kind of work will you be doing and others doing trying to save amphibians? Well, what I'm doing right now is working on some diseases. I'm working on that chytrid fungus, and I'm working on saprolignia, which is a type of water mold. These are two types of diseases that have hit amphibians where I live in the Pacific Northwest. but They're also global. They're all over the world. We don't exactly understand everything about the chytrid fungus. We don't know where it came from and why it's starting to be so prevalent all over. We do know that the other disease I'm looking at has been around for a long time, and it, a lot of it has come in from stocked fishes, transfers from fishes to amphibians. So what we're trying to do is look at the chytrid fungus in more detail to see whether or not there are some environmental changes that have triggered the chytrid fungus to break out. Interestingly enough, some types of animals are more susceptible than others. Bullfrogs seem to be carriers of the fungus, but they don't seem to get sick, Hmm. and they seem to be spreading it. And what do you think is the answer to that? Well, they have some type of immune system that doesn't let them get sick, But they're carrying it around, and we've done experiments in my lab that show that they can give it to other species. And is there anything about the bullfrog that might then be extracted, synthesized, multiplied? Good point. Lots of animals have some types of peptides that allow them to cope with different types of pathogens, and bullfrogs may have some of these. Some people have isolated peptides that knock off pathogens from herpes all the way to the chytrid fungus, and people are looking at that. So that's going to be a possibility down the road. How would you distribute medicine to the wild amphibian world if you could come up with something from a bullfrog that might fight off the fungus? Good question. I don't really know how you do that. I don't know how you do it in the field. And amphibians, as you said, are like canaries in a coal mine. If something is hitting amphibians, other organisms, including people, will be affected eventually by some of these same factors. So we're really looking at these as model systems to study disease spread and the effects of environmental change. It's not just an amphibian problem here. It's a major problem for people. The whole world. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this Earth Files podcast from the edges of science, environment, and real X-Files. Go to www.earthfiles.com to see more than a thousand Earth Files reports with photographs, drawings, and documents. And visit Earth Files every day, every week, for new reports and new podcasts. That's www.earthfiles.com. Earth Files.